In my first video on this vintage Teammate game computer, I took it apart, reverse engineered its circuit, and dumped its ROM. Today, I will be refurbishing this computer and then accomplishing my childhood goal of creating my own programs for the Teammate game computer. Welcome to the exciting conclusion of my two-part series on my childhood toy, the Teammate game computer by Logix. If you didn't watch the first video in the series, I would encourage you to pause right here and click the link in the upper left hand corner in order to watch that first video. In that video, I go over what the teammate computer is, I go into how it works, I take it apart and even reverse engineer it. In this video, I wanna cover a few more things. First, I wanna mention that since the last video, I was able to work with the MAME emulation team in order to get the teammate game computer incorporated into the MAME emulator. So, if you don't have access to hardware, you can still try out the Teammate computer by downloading the MAME emulator and running the Teammate software in it. A big shout out goes to the GitHub user HAP, spelled with five Ps, who did most of the work to make that happen. So, thanks HAP. If you're interested in trying, I do have a link to the MAME emulator and instructions on how to specifically run the Teammate's game computer in that emulator in my Teammate GitHub repository, the link to which is down in the description of this video. The next thing I want to cover is actually getting my teammate computer back together. At the end of the last video, my teammate computer was in complete disarray. It was taken apart. There was various things broken on it. It was dirty. So in this video, I'm generally going to get it back together and refurbish the computer to make it look like new. The final thing I want to cover is the goal that set this whole project in motion in the first place, which is to run custom software on the teammate game computer. So I'm going to get into the challenges of making that happen, the idiosyncrasies of the teammate computer itself, the challenges of writing software for the Mostec 3870, and the various other tips and tricks that I had to do employ in order to get the software working. Spoiler alert is that I actually do get it working and at the end of the video, I'll demonstrate a few pieces of software that I did right. But before we do any of that, since the last video, one of the viewers of that video did reach out to me and say that he had a teammate computer in storage that he wasn't using and asked if I wanted to have it. And so we came to an agreement and he shipped it my way. And so here it is. One thing I find interesting about this is one, I didn't have the box to my computer, so now I have a box to the teammate computer, so that's kind of cool. But if you look closely on the box, the image of this teammate computer isn't, doesn't exactly look like the teammate computer I have. And so I wanna get into that, dig into what is different about this teammate computer that he shipped me. Does it even work? And if it doesn't work, can I use it for salvage? So why don't we start off with that? So one of my viewers saw my last video and remembered he too had a teammate game computer stored in his back room or something and didn't want it anymore. So he sent it to me and here it is. It appears to be in worse shape than my original one that I, my last video was on and you've seen me repair it so far in this video. However, I do want to check it out, see if there's anything I can uh, salvage from it or maybe bring this one back to life. So let's power it on and see if it's working. And turn it on. Kind of see the uh, LED lights. They've certainly fallen in this case. Let's uh, go ahead and put in one of the programs. Let's do the, uh, oh, this keyboard is in worse shape than my original one. Don't quite know what's going on here. I see these LEDs flashing back and forth. Let's see if I programmed it wrong. Okay, clearly the speaker is not working. You can see the LEDs flashing as it would, as it was playing the song but uh, the speaker is not working. Could be a loose wire, could be anything. I won't know until I open this one up. But I don't think I am going to fully refix this. I think I'm gonna salvage it for part. The reason being, here's the blue case from my original teammate computer. And maybe you can see it on the camera, but it's much clearer in person. I mentioned before that my blue case is yellowed some. This one is very blue, it's very cleanly blue. And so I think I'm going to take the blue case from this one and use it to rebuild mine. Also, mine has some chips here. The, this one doesn't. So the, the, the case here is in better shape. This keyboard, not working. The speaker's not working. Interestingly, the Mostec 3870 in this one is a ceramic case where mine was plastic case. So that, that's interesting to keep. I probably could bring this one back to life. I'll, I'll, I'll do that. But my first focus is to rebuild my original teammate computer in a very pristine form, as pristine as I can get it. So I'll be using this case. So let me go do that. 
So I got this teammate open, and immediately I was a bit surprised. Other than, other than the, you know, clearly it's not be the best shape. Here's the keycaps, stickers that I found on the inside. Um, but clearly, this keyboard, much different than the keyboard in my original one. Fascinating. It looks like this keyboard is just a bunch of metal strips that were cleverly designed to touch each other when the keys were pressed. I got to say that I think the keyboard I have works better than this one. I mean, I can tell you just by the feel. So let's get this apart so I can uh, use this blue case. Before putting my teammate back together, I gave the case a thorough cleaning. I didn't use anything special, just some soapy water and a clean scouring sponge. I also needed to attach the speaker to its new case from the second teammate unit. Finally, there were a few repairs that I needed to make. Okay, I need to replace the capacitor here. I tested it, and though it says it is 1,000 microfarads, it has no capacitance at all. So I got some new ones. I'm going to replace it, recap it. This thing's at least 40 years old. It's reasonable that I need to recap it anyway. So let's get started on that. So I'm here putting the teammate back together. And one of the things I did was redo the solder for where this wire goes to the on-off switch. And then I, I originally unscrewed the screw to kind of redo this wire. But then when I would screw it back together, I cracked the plastic there. And it was easy to do. Now, this plastic, plastic is old. So if you zoom in here, you can see it much better. You can see how that plastic is missing. You can actually see the, the screw right there. So I need to fix that before I put it back together because as, a, as you can see, the switch goes over this and missing that plastic will reduce the structural integrity of that post. And I want this thing to break again. So the way I'm going to fix that is to use some of this stuff here, this plastic weld. Supposedly I can mold it to the shape and it will cure into place and provide the structural integrity that I need to replace. So let me do that. I have to wear gloves when I work with it, so on the go. So all I need to do here is to cut out a certain amount. And once I have both the colors, I just sit here and I roll this around to mix it. What I'm assuming is happening here is that uh, mixing two chemos goes together that will start the chemical reaction that will cause this plastic to cure and become hard. That looks good enough. Let's uh, break off a piece and put it in place. I don't mind how this looks, so I don't need it to look pretty. I just need it to be structurally sound. Okay, I think that's it. Now, this takes three hours to cure, so let's sit here for a while. Okay, I've cleaned up the keys and i got to put them back. Now, the thing i got to remember is that this is upside down, so they go reverse. So, P1 goes here. Okay, keys are in place. Now to put the keyboard back down. Now that the teammate is mostly reassembled, I need to apply some hot glue to keep it together. As you might recall from my first video on this teammate computer, the original makers used hot glue to hold the various parts of this computer together. Here I am gluing the LED array back in place. Now I need to glue the main board to the outer blue case. The only hard part of this process was holding the parts in place long enough for the glue to set. The final piece is the black bottom panel, which gets both screws to hold it in place and glue to seal it up. So here is my teammate game computer, completely reassembled. I gotta admit, it looks better than it did when I first took it out of the box from my parents' attic. Now, I did use the case from the teammate computer that was sent to me, 
And I gotta say, it, it does look better than what my original case looked like. So this this blue case is not the original, but everything else is the original. I did try to dump the Mostec 3870 that was in the teammate computer that was sent to me. It was this one. It's a nice uh, ceramic case, but I couldn't get it working. I could not get a any data off of it. In fact, when I tried to stick this into a circuit, it didn't work at all. Like I tried to stick it into my game computer and it didn't drive it. So I do think that game computer, that that teammate game computer that was sent to me, was but plainly it was broken. When I did turn it on originally, it didn't have sound. It, it, a few other things did not work well. So I think the, the, the core of the problem was this chip here. Now, it does look nice. I do like the ceramic case uh, as compared to the plastic case in my original Mostec 3870. But, you know, the, the good thing that did come from getting that teammate computer is I did get a much bluer and cleaner outside plastic case to this thing. And now, this looks nice. And it looks brand new, honestly. So let's see this work. Now, what I did do is I left the Mostec 38 P70 in place, and I have an EEPROM that has been programmed with the original teammate ROM that came off of my original Mostec 3870. So let's go ahead and turn this on and just demonstrate that it is working. There we go. I get the startup image. Uh, let's go ahead and do the uh, this keyboard works really nice. So I'm going to do the uh, pattern design that originally demonstrated. Yeah, the keyboard works much better now that I got it all cleaned. There we go. It's running. Play the music. Eight e. Okay, that is working. Now let's... uh. Let's go move on to the goal that I have of actually programming this. Now that I got this all set up and I can uh, install an EEPROM with my own code on it, let's go let's go figure that out and make that happen. So one of the things that I need to implement in order to write my own software is something called multiplexing. What multiplexing does is turn on the LEDs and the hex display on this device on and off very quickly so that it looks like they're continuously on. So what multiplexing takes advantage of is the persistence of vision that your eyes, the human eyes, actually have. The fact that lights do not have to be continuously on for your eyes to perceive them as continuously on. This opens up several possibilities for clever designs. For one, you can reduce the pin count needed in order to control the set of LEDs. Take, for example, the Teammate 4x4 LED grid. It is wired like this. In this diagram, the gray lines are connected to the LED cathodes, and the numbers represent the LED anodes that have been connected to each other. Future Michael here. After editing this video, I realize I made a mistake in this explanation that you're about to get on multiplexing. Simply put, I swapped the anode and cathode in the following description. If you study the teammate schematic that I presented in my first video, you will note that the LED array has a common anode design, not a common cathode design, as I describe in the following explanation. However, I'm not going to change this video because I don't think this mistake fundamentally alters the multiplexing explanation that I'm about to give you. So, as you listen to this, know that I got the anode and cathode swapped as compared to what you see in the schematic. And I apologize if this creates any confusion. Now, back to the video. All lines are connected back to the Mostec 3870 in the Team A computer, with the anodes going through a line driver first. Note that I am not showing here how the hex display on the Team A is wired for multiplexing. See my last video for a detailed review of the electrical schematic. In this video, I'm just going to cover the high-level process of multiplexing. What I describe here for the LED array applies equally to the hex display. Now let's say we want to turn on the LED in the upper left corner. To do that, we would power the cathode line on the left side of the array and power the anode pin number 4. Note that this energizes all of the left side LED cathodes and both of the anodes for the two LEDs that are connected to pin 4. However, since only the upper left LED has both its anode and cathode energized, it is the only LED that will be lit. Similarly, if we want to light the LED on the lower right corner, we would energize the right side cathode and anode pin 0. 
However, there is a challenge when you want to light both the lower right and upper left LEDs. If we energize both the cathode lines and then anode lines 0 and 4, you see that the problem is, is we get two extra LEDs to light because both of their anodes and cathodes are also energized, but we don't want this. To light only the upper left and lower right corner LEDs, we are going to need to alternate energizing the lines for the left side LEDs and the right side LEDs. That is, at any given moment, only one of the common cathode lines are energized, and when any given cathode line is energized, the corresponding anode lines are energized to light the desired LEDs. If this alternating is done fast enough, the human eye will not be able to see the LED blinking on and off, and instead perceive the two corner LEDs as being continuously on. So this seems like a lot of work, and you might justifiably ask, why bother? Why not directly light each LED and have no blinking? Well, there are two good reasons to use multiplexing like I described. The first reason is that multiplexing requires fewer wires to be connected to the CPU. In this teammate computer, only 10 connections to the Mostec 3870 CPU are required in order to manage the 16 LEDs. And then the hex displays only require two more wires in order to incorporate them into the overall multiplexing for this teammate computer. That means only 12 CPU connections are required to manage the 30 LEDs found in the LED matrix and the hex display. The other CPU control pins are now free to be used to do other things, thus making the overall system more capable. The second reason for multiplexing is that it reduces the power requirement of the display. For example, if we desire to have all 16 LEDs illuminated, multiplexing the LEDs via two banks as is done in the teammate requires half the power as compared to powering all the LEDs directly. This is because at any given moment, only half of the LEDs are on. Again, the powering on and off of the LEDs happens so fast that your eyes don't perceive them blinking. It's worth noting that your eyes can perceive that it's receiving about half the photons that it would receive if the LEDs were illuminated continuously. So when multiplexing, the LEDs will look dimmer than they would if they were powered directly. However, the LEDs are still sufficiently bright enough to fulfill their purpose. Now let's take a look at the custom code I wrote to affect the multiplexing needed for this teammate game computer. The Mostec 3870 CPU in the teammate computer is in the Fairchild F8 family of CPUs, and so it uses the F8 instruction set. I am using my bespoke ASM customizable assembler with the instruction set configuration file for the Mostec 3870. A link to the Bespoke ASM customizable assembler and the Mostec 3870 instruction set configuration can be found in the video description below. Probably the first thing I want to show is the fact that what I'm doing here is using a timer in order to ensure the multiplexing code is called consistently. To set that up, we start off where the program gets initiated at address zero and we initialize the display. I have to initialize some variables in, in RAM, but then we set these various values to ports 7 and 6. And port 7 gets the timer counter value. This is the value that is going to be counted down to 0. And port 6 gets various interrupt configuration bits. These I've defined up here, and you can see exactly what they are. The interrupt config bits are setting the prescaler and enabling the timer interrupt specifically. So the idea here is the timer is going to fire at specific intervals, and when it does, it's going to call this timer handler. Now on the Mostec 3870, the timer handler has to be at a very specific address. It's specifically, it is hex 20. And so I defined a memory zone called timer handler that actually starts at hex 20. And so that means by me declaring that this handler is in memory zone timer handler, uh, it's going to be at the right address. And all this handler does, the first thing it needs to do is disable other ups so that the timer doesn't fire again while we're actually handling the multiplexing. And then the first thing it needs to do is save all the register states for various registers in this computer. The reason you need to do that is because the timer will have interrupted some other code that's running. And when the timer is done, we're going to return to back where we left off in that code. If suddenly all the register states have changed for that original code, it's going to crash. 
And so we need to save all of the registers. And that's what all this code here is doing, is saving the registers to various locations so that they get preserved so that when I'm done with the timer handler, I can restore all the registers and then return back to the original code. Once the registers have been saved, I then call my display handler, which actually affects the multiplexing. That display handler is actually in another file where my display library is. In this library, I describe the actual physical layout of the LEDs. And you can see here how what I described in the multiplexing section of this video, how there are two banks, the left side and the right side. And in each of these banks, the LEDs have specific numbers. I go into the various details on how to turn them on and turn them off. But I'm gonna, what I'm going to get to is this specifically the display handler, which is down here at the bottom of the file. And what the display handler does is do the multiplexing. Each call of the display handler configures the CPU pins for one of the common cathode lines. This means it takes four timer interrupts in sequence to cycle through all four common cathode lines on the teammate. The first thing the handler does is determine which part of the cycle it is in. That is, it is it in the left bank of the LED array, the right bank, or the left hex display, or the right hex display. It does that using something called a jump table. So I have a variable that is storing, it's basically just a counter, it counts from 0, 1, 2, and 3. And I load that variable and I add it to this address here. This address is the jump table address. It tells me where I need to go in order to handle whatever stage of the multiplexing process I'm in. The way a jump table works is that basically you can see what follows in this jump table are a series of branch instructions that go to very specific parts of the code. I know each of these instructions are two bytes. Uh, the branch instruction itself is one byte, and then the offset, since this is a relative addressing type of instruction, the office it itself is also one byte. So it takes two bytes for each one of these entries. And so back here, what you can see I'm doing, I am adding the multiplexing stage to the base address twice. So the base address gets loaded into it, the memory address register, and then I add the multiplexing stage to it twice in order to get exactly what address I should be jumping to in order to then jump to the handler for the specific multiplexing stage that I'm in. And that's what happens here. This, these instructions right here then execute a jump to into this jump table, and then this jump table jumps to one of these various functions that then take care of what needs to be taken care of in order to configure the various pins to show this phase in the multiplexing process. These are pretty simple, except for this left hex display part of the uh, process. The left hex display is a little bit more complicated than the right because I implemented the ability to display some special characters on the left hex display, like the minus sign and the P character. Now, how all of these hex display characters are implemented is actually just a lookup table. You can go back here and you can see that I have created basically a bitmap of which anode lines for the hex display need to be turned on in order to create a very specific character on the hex display. The hex displays themselves are just seven segment displays. And if you're familiar with uh, seven segment mapping for you know, the A segment, B segment, C segment, and so on, you, you would recognize exactly what's going on here. In order to show the value zero, I need to light up all the outside LEDs. To show the value one, it's just the two right vertical LEDs and so on. Now for the special characters, I also figured out you know, what I need to do in order to show the P character, underscore, and a dash. And all the code does down here is figure out what character I'm supposed to show based on the value that has been saved to the hex display RAM variable, and then just configure the anode lines in order to display that character on the hex display. When it's done, we then update the handler state, basically incrementing what phase of the multiplexing process that we are in so that the next call to this handler will be on the right phase and then save various variables in order to keep track of various things. And when all done, it returns back to the kernel handler, which actually then restores all the original register values, and then return the control back to the original code that was running. So let's see that code in action. Now, 
I've written a demo program that just shows some images on the screen and uh, puts values on the hex. And I placed it on this EEPROM here. And so true to why I'm using the Mostic 38 P70 is I can take the EEPROM off that has the original teammate code on it. And I can place this EEPROM in that actually has the the new program that I wrote. Okay, it's in there. Let's go ahead and close this back up. And turn the computer on. Now it's a fairly simple demo program. You can see it's just incrementing all the LEDs across the screen and incrementing the value on the hex. When it gets to the bottom of the screen, it starts turning off the LEDs at the top and you can see the hex value continues to increment. Now, I did, like I said, I did implement a way to slow down the multiplexing so you can actually see it happen. So what it does is it's, it freezes the image that's on the screen and freezes the value and then just cycles through the banks so you can see it moving from one bank to another. So let's do that right now. And you can see it. Here's left bank, right bank, left, right. Now, one thing you'll notice while it's cycling through the various multiplexing banks is that the LEDs are brighter in this mode than they were when the multiplexing was going faster, uh, such that uh, you could see a continuous LED being on. But in reality, the LED was only on one fourth of the time because it has to cycle through four different banks in order to show all the various multiplexing stages. Anyway, I can put it back to the fast multiplexing, and you can see that LEDs are now a little bit dimmer, both on here and in the hex display. But that's what you get when you multiplex. There are less photons coming out, uh, and thus your eye does perceive it as dimmer. But because it's blinking so fast, your eye actually perceives it as the LED being continuously on. So with that, I have technically accomplished my goal of writing custom software for my teammate computer. However, I have another piece of code that I like to show off. For those of you who have watched my Pewty One custom TTL CPU project, know that I have a special affinity for the factorial algorithm. It's a deceivingly simple algorithm that, if fully explored, can touch many concepts in computer science. So I will use it to demonstrate that I have accomplished my goal of running my very own program on this teammate game computer. I'm not going to go over every detail of the Factorio code, but one thing I will show off is part of the algorithm. Since I'm writing code for the bare CPU, it doesn't have the concepts implemented that a higher level programming language might provide, such as multiplying two numbers. Here is the function I implemented to multiply two 8-bit values. You might recall I wrote a similar function for my Pewty1 TTL CPU. I've also written similar functions for SLU4's minimal UART CPU, the 6502 CPU, the 8085 CPU, and the Z80 CPUs. I've got to say that writing a bit shifting based out multiplication algorithm for the MOSTEC 3870 proved to be the most challenging. There are two main issues. First, the Mostec 3870 has only 64 bytes of scratch pad RAM, and accessing it is not as simple as dereferencing a memory address. Well, technically, you are doing that, but you can't load the memory address directly. You first need to load the memory address into the accumulator, like I am doing here, and then you move the value in the accumulator to the IS register, which represents the memory address that you actually want to read. Then you want to update the accumulator value here CLR actually sets the accumulator to zero and then you can load that value to the dereference IS register in order to set memory at that location to the value you want. It's a multi-step process that on later CPUs require only one instruction. The second issue is with the shift function that the Mostec 3870 supports. When multiplying two 8-bit numbers you actually need to do a 16-bit shift. On an 8-bit CPU, that means you need to execute the shift operation twice, once for each of the 8-bit parts of the 16-bit value. Most CPUs implement a 9-bit shift rotation. 
where the bit that gets pushed off with the shift operation gets placed into the carry flag, and what was in the carry flag gets placed into the newly empty bit caused by the left or right shift. This allows you to chain shift operations across multiple bytes, capturing the bit that got shifted off one byte and then shifting that bit into the next byte. Unfortunately, the MOSTEC 3870, and in fact, the F8 instruction set in general, only does a 7-bit shift, causing the bit that got shifted off to be lost, and always setting the shifted in bit to zero. For me, to do bit shifting across multiple bytes, I had to write code that actually captured the bit that was getting shifted off before the shift operation occurred, saving that bit, and that's what's happening here, I'm capturing with the value of the bit by ending the value, current value to 1, and then saving the value of that bit to a local register, and then doing the shift operation. And once I've done that shift operation, when I do the shift on the next bit, I then bring that register value back in and add it into the value that just got shifted. This means that the bit shifting part of the multiplication algorithm I wrote for the MOSTEC 3070 is more complicated than what I had to do for the other CPUs. Nonetheless, as you can see here, I did get the algorithm implemented and then wrote a factorial calculator based on this multiplication algorithm. So let's go see that work. Okay, I've burned the factorial program I wrote into this EEPROM, so let's put it in and see it run. Turn things off. Up. Get the EEPROMs in, close things back up, and then turn it on. So I program things such that when it starts up or when there's a value it can't calculate, it's going to put this little square pattern on the uh, screen. It's just to indicate that it didn't calculate anything. What I did do is program it so I press a key and it's going to calculate the factorial of that particular number and then show the results here on the hex display. So the factorial of zero is definitionally one. I've also lit LED zero here on the screen just to show you which key you pressed. The factorial of one is also one. The factorial of two is two. And the factorial of three is six. Now the thing I want to emphasize is that this is not doing a simple lookup. It, it, I, I did not create a table of factorial values. I'm actually calculating it with the multiplication algorithm that I just showed you. The factorial of 4 is 24, or 18 in hex. And then the factorial of 5 is 120, or 78 in hex. Since this number display can only show two digits, I decided to show the values in hex because that gives me more range of values that I can actually display. So let's go ahead and see what the factorial of 6 is. Well, it didn't calculate it. In fact, you got the square pattern and the hex display went blank. The reason for that is 6 factorial is actually 720, but that value is larger than what can be held in an 8-bit value or displayed on an 8-bit display. Now, technically, the multiplication algorithm I just showed you can actually calculate this because it does produce outputs uh, at a 16-bit level. But my hex display here is only an 8-bit hex display, and so I just decided to cut things off at 5 factorial, and this would be the, the maximum value that this program is going to calculate. If you'd like to see a program that can calculate a higher level of factorial, go check out my video for my PewDie 1 TTL computer where I actually calculate a 64-bit factorial on my TTL computer and then print the display all 20 digits to my display that I have on that computer. So there, success. I have accomplished my childhood goal of writing my very own software for my teammate game computer. At this point, you might ask why I haven't implemented sound in my custom programs. The truth of that matter is that producing quality sound proved to be more challenging than I have the time to invest in right now. At issue is getting pure frequencies produced, which require a high level of consistency as to when the sound subroutine fires. This is possible, but it requires me to sit down and count the number of clock cycles for each instruction. I'll come back to that in the future when I have some time to be able to address that challenge. So that will be it for this video. 
I hope you enjoyed this journey we took into thoroughly reviewing one of my favorite childhood toys. I learned a lot and got a chance to accomplish one of my childhood goals. If you like these sort of videos, please do subscribe to my channel. I don't produce videos often, but when I do, I like to explore the topic in depth, sharing with you what I learned along the way. Also, if you like this specific video, please do comment and like the video. And if there's enough interest, I will circle back and create the sound code for the teammate computer. So thanks for watching, and until next time, goodbye.